All right. So in the previous uh, class, we were discussing different properties of the system. So that's what we will study in a more mathematical manner today. Uh, so there are six properties of systems that are found in uh, some of a combination of these properties are satisfied in a very, very large class of systems. Uh, and that's what we will be. Um, and so that's why we are studying these properties. So those six properties are memoryless property, invertibility, causality, stability, time invariance, and linearity. So let's go over it one by one. So we'll talk about memoryless system first. So in the memoryless system, the definition is um, that the output y of t is some function of the input. So this is in the continuous time in the discrete time. Um, it can be written as yn is some function of xn. So in particular, yt or yn does not depend on x tau, tau not equal to t, or x uh, n, no, n is already used, x m, m not equal to n. So this is memoryless system. Okay, this f can be any function. Okay, so examples of memoryless system would be yt equals to txt yt equals to xt square yt equals to xt square minus 3xt and so on these are all examples of memoryless system the output is, um, it doesn't depend on the inputs from the past or inputs from the future. Okay, let's look at some examples of systems with memory. Could you uh, still show those last two lines, please? I'm almost yeah. there. Yeah. So naturally, the memoryless system uh, does not require knowledge of the output is not dependent on what happened in the past and what's going to happen in the future or the inputs from the future. Uh, so naturally, in systems with memory, uh, what happens, the inputs that you gave in the past or the inputs that you may anticipate in the future would affect the output at a particular time. So one of the simplest example or two simple examples of systems with memory, one is the integrator or accumulator. So 
So y t equals to integral of x tau d tau from minus infinity to cap to small t. So this is the integrator or y n equals to sorry summation k equals minus infinity to n x x k so this is the integrator this is the accumulator accumulator Okay, so in systems with memory, what what the inputs you gave in the past affects the output at time t. So this is the inputs from the past. This is the output at time t. So the past inputs influence the output. Same thing with accumulator as well. So accumulator is the integrator in, disc, in discrete time um, systems. And the second very important System, uh, class of systems with memory is the one where you have delays. So xt, sorry, yt equals to xt minus tau. Tau is the delay. Or yn equals to xn minus n naught. N naught is the delay. So if you if you can remember um, in the capacitor it integrates current so capacitor basically acts as an integrator for current and the output would be the potential difference across the capacitor and uh, yeah so that's an integrator system that's a system with memory capacitor is a system with memory the resistor is a system without memory so the potential difference across the resistance the resistor is just the current multiplied by the resistance itself. So, um, so that's a memoryless system. Resistor is a memoryless system. Capacitor is a system with memory. Um, delay. Uh, so one example of delay system with delay is, you know, if you turn on the thermostat, let's say you uh, you go and raise your temperature by a few degrees Fahrenheit in your at your home. Uh, from your thermostat, it's not like the heater is going to turn on immediately and start heating the entire house. It's going to take a few seconds for the heater to get started and start heating the house. So that's a simple example of a system with delay where you gave an input at time t, but the output actually started uh, coming after a delay of a few seconds. So delays are very, very um, important class of systems with memory. Any questions on memoryless system? So typically when you have a system with memory, not typically, actually, in some cases, a system with memory means that energy is getting stored within the system in some way. Okay. Let's talk about inverse invertible system. And the definition is distinct input leads to 
distinct or distinct inputs lead to distinct outputs. Okay, so as I'm speaking into the microphone, my voice is getting converted into, um, uh, into bits. Those bits are then transmitted to your computer and your computer uh, runs some program to convert those bits back into voice signals. And so you're able to hear my voice exactly as I'm speaking. Um, that's a example of an invertible system, okay? The most important examples of invertible system is exactly what I talked about, which is encoding and compression. Okay, so I'm talking about lossless compression. So zipping. What, what is lossless compression? Yeah, so uh, good question. So zipping, you know, like you have a bunch of files, you can zip those files and create a zip file. So that's a lossless compression. By lossless, I mean that uh, you can unzip the file and recover the files that you had originally zipped exactly. There's no, there's no difference. So that's a lossless compression. A lossless okay. compression is uh, you took a picture let's say in a PNG format, and then you converted that format to JPEG. So JPEG is a loss, lossy compression scheme. So it compresses the size of the file, but uh, you can't recover the original file from JPEG because some amount of information gets lost in that compression. Um, I'll give you some, some assignment uh, about this lossy compression at some point of time in the future when we study Fourier transform and stuff. So one of the earliest compression scheme was using Fourier, uh, uh, using Fourier series to compress files. So it's a very important class of uh, compression schemes. Encoding is basically my voice signal getting encoded into bits and then getting transferred to your computer. And then after that, it basically gets decoded back into the audio signal. So that's encoding and that's a invertible system. The encoder would be called an invertible system. Okay, so let's look at another example of integrator. Let's look at the accumulator because that example is much easier. So I have y n equals to summation k equals minus infinity to n x k. So if I if I know the sequence y minus infinity all the way to y zero y one and so on. I can actually uh, do the following transformation, xk equals to yk minus yk minus one. So I can subtract the consecutive points in the signal in order to recover the input to the signal xk. In the case of integrator, you just have to take the derivative of yk. So that's another example of uh, invertible system. 
I can look at the output and I can reconstruct the input exactly. Cool. Any question on invertible systems? Okay, let's talk about stable systems. So there are many class of many uh, notions of stability in the systems community, but we are in this particular class and for the purpose of 3050, this is the notion of stability we will be using Bounded input leads to bounded output. This is known as BIBO stability. B I B O stable system. Bounded input, bounded output, stable system. <clears throat> What this implies is if x of t is less than equal to b, this implies y of t is less than equal to c. So c can be different from b, but as long as the input is bounded, the output is also going to be bounded. This is for all t. Sorry, what did you say B and C were again? B, I, B, O, bounded input, bounded output, stable system. So bounded input leads to bounded output. So if XT, uh, absolute value of XT is less than equal to B, which means that the input is bounded for all time, then the output is also going to be bounded for all time. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, so let's look at an example. Y of t equals to e raised to x of t. So if x was bounded by 10, then y will be bounded from e raised to 10. This is an example of a bounded uh, system. Uh, typically systems that are bounded have some sort of, uh, sorry, systems that are stable have some sort of dissipative property, which means that the energy from the system is getting dissipated in some other form. So stable systems. typically have some way to dissipate energy. Okay, so if you're driving a car, um, it's stable because the energy is getting dissipated because of the rolling friction on the road and the aerodynamic friction because of the movement of the car. So that's why it's a stable system. Let's look at an example of an unstable system. So the bounded input can lead to unbounded output. Now, you know, this notion of unboundedness is quite uh, 
it's not it's not quite it does not quite mean that yt will go to infinity but something bad will happen okay so in in mathematical sense we say that okay the output is going to go to infinity but in reality something bad will happen something undesirable will happen okay and one of the undesirable thing that happened in one of the previous lecture was when a bridge collapsed because of uh because the airflow bridge was getting excited because of the airflow because of the wind around the bridge so even though there was no input to the bridge or rather the input to the bridge was the wind like the input coming from the wind energy it sort of keep kept accumulating the energy from the wind which eventually led to its collapse so something undesirable happened even though the oscillations didn't become infinity uh the bridge actually collapsed which is what unbounded output means so one example of a unstable system is inverted pendulum okay so when you have an inverted pendulum if it is exactly at 90 degrees it's uh it's static nothing is happening but you give it a very very small uh push very small push okay and then you will see that the inverted pendulum would actually stabilize here so an inverted pendulum is an example of an unstable system okay uh, i'm not sure if you have done experiments about how to stabilize inverted pendulum using control probably that's not something you've done so far but uh, but that's a a cool fun project in the control theory area which is to stabilize the inverted pendulum so inverted pendulum is a example of an unstable system the another example of an unstable system is a rocket a rocket is almost like an inverted pendulum that's like an inverted pendulum and uh, uh, a lot of effort has gone into Uh, making rocket fly into the space because inherently it's an unstable system so you have to do a lot of engineering to stabilize the system and make sure that it follows a specific trajectory from earth to the space okay so that's another example of a unstable inherently unstable the system itself is unstable if you leave the rocket it's going to fall off it's going to fall off the ground but a lot of work goes on in order to make sure that it goes into the space Uh, another example of an unstable system is a uh, nuclear nuclear reactor so if you don't do anything in nuclear reactor uh, it's going to blow up so that's the unstable reaction uh, so in order to control the reaction in order to make the system stable you actually insert graphite rods or heavy water in the nuclear reactor so that you can slow down the neutrons and not lead to a chain reaction which could lead to instability so new nuclear reactor again you have to spend a lot of effort into controlling the energy coming out of a nuclear reactor so the but these are inherently unstable systems so so even though in reality we would like to have stability in all the systems a lot of the systems that you will encounter in real world are inherently unstable and so you have to put in some effort some intelligent effort to making sure that they are stable a uh, combustion of gasoline that's also an unstable reaction and that's why uh, you know uh, gas pumps they use a lot of technology to make sure that the gasoline and air doesn't come in contact or if they come in contact there's no um, flammable substance nearby so so that it doesn't catch fire those are unstable systems okay any questions on unstable or stable systems so yeah for your example earlier would the complex exponential be an unstable system uh so so let's 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 look at it what kind of complex exponential are you talking about so let's say y um, of e uh so you have to tell me a system where you give it an input xt 
and the output yt goes to infinity. So, so what is that system you're talking about? Complex exponential is a signal, right? I believe it was from the first lecture you gave an example where it uh, was exponentially increasing. Right, so that's the bridge example that I was talking about. Okay. Right, so, so let's look at the bridge example, okay? So this is... the Puma narrow bridge, the input is wind, the output is vibrations or oscillations. And what I was saying is that this is an unstable system. That's why even though the wind was bounded, it's not like, you know, there is a cyclone or, or hurricane in that region. The wind is constant, but the oscillations became unbounded. That's because the bridge was actually accumulating all the energy from the wind. It was acting as an accumulator, not as a dissipator of wind energy. So ever since, actually this happened around 1940s, I, I, I don't remember the exact year, but it happened around 1940s and all, a lot of uh, uh, bridge engineering work was taken uh, after that in order to make sure that the, the bridges have some way of dissipating the energy that they are accumulating because of wind uh, passing through the bridge. I, I, mm, well, when I teach 3551, I, I go into more in depth about why this bridge collapsed, but maybe, you know, in signals and systems, I can't go into that depth. In 3551, you will learn more about it. Any other question? Okay, let's talk about time invariance. Oh, I missed causality. So let's talk about causal systems. So definition of causal system y t depends on x tau tau less than equal to t y n depends on x x m or x k k less than equal to n so these are causal systems they do not anticipate future values non anticipative or causal both are synonymously used in the signals and systems literature non anticipative or causal they mean the same thing So one example is integrator or accumulator for a causal system. Um, other example could be just some simple difference equation. So you are just subtracting two consecutive, uh, sorry, the previous value from the current value. This is like the stock market, what happens in stock market. Uh, you say that the stock has gone up 10% or gone down 10%. That's because the difference is 10% of the previous value or something like that. So those are causal systems. They do not anticipate the future values. 
So would a causal system be the same thing as a system with memory? Uh, right, so system with memory, so causal system is certainly, no, so, well, okay, so they are actually different concepts. So let's say yn equals to xn. So this is a memoryless system, but it's a causal system. It's memory, causal, causal memoryless. And this is causal, but with memory. Causal with memory. So they are actually distinct concepts. Okay. Uh, let me, yn equals to xn minus one plus xn plus one over two. So this is not causal with memory. Thanks for this question. So now you can see the difference between these two concepts. So this is, so let's look at third, first, second, third. So these are the three systems we have. In the first one, uh, the output at time n depends only on the current uh, input and the past input. So it's a causal system. And because it depends on the past input, it is a causal system with memory. In the second system, it's a memoryless system and it's causal because the output depends on the current input only. Let me put maybe five for fun or maybe not five, maybe xn square, just for fun. So, so this is a causal memoryless system. Um, and then the third one is, is a not non-causal system because the output depends on the future value of x, but it has memory because the output depends on the past value as well as the future value. So therefore it has memory, it's not memoryless. Okay, so let me give you an example of a causal system and then the non-causality that comes out after this. So right now we are going through this Zoom meeting. It is actually a causal memoryless system. Like if you look at the Zoom as a software. So as I'm speaking, it converts the audio signal and the, the my laptop's uh, image. It converts it into bits. It transfers it to your computer and then displays the same thing and produces the same sound as uh, what I'm speaking here uh, and what I'm writing on the board, on the tablet. So this is a causal system. This is a memoryless system. Now I am going to record this whole video and I'm going to upload it to YouTube. Now, when it goes to the YouTube, YouTube has this entire time series in front of it, which is from time zero all the way to time 55 minutes. It has the entire video, the entire audio and so what it's going to do is it's going to apply some compression scheme on the video so that it reduces the size of the video and distributes it into chunk and puts it on the servers. So that's a non-causal system, you know, because it's doing, it's looking at the entire time series at once. It's not doing it like, bit, uh, like frame by frame. It's looking at the entire time series and then doing the compression. So typically compression schemes are are non-causal. Compression is usually non-causal. Usually, okay, there are compression schemes that would be causal, but typically the compression schemes are non-causal systems. Any other question? Let's look at the fifth uh, property, which is time 
invariance invariance time invariance right okay so what's the definition let's say i give an input xt to a system and i get an output yt now a time invariant system i give an input xt minus t not and the output is y of t minus t not so the output shifts by the same amount if you shift the input Okay, so this is my input. This is my output through this system. Now I'm going to shift the input. This is my X of T minus T naught. This is my T naught. I pass it through the system and my output will be This is T naught. Okay, so I shift my input and the output shifts by the same amount. Okay. Now let's look at an example. So y t equals to sine of x of t. So this is a time invariant system because if I give it an input, Okay, now if I give it an input x t minus t naught, my output is going to be sine of x of t minus t naught, which is the same as y of t minus t naught. Okay, so this is an example of a time invariant system. Let me give you another example, which is the integrator y of n equals to summation k equals minus infinity to n x of k. Now, this is, this is an accumulator. 
So let's give it an input x of k minus uh, n0. So let's look at k equals minus infinity to n x of k minus n0. This is the input I'm giving. What would this be equal to? So let me do a change of variable. So I'm going to do change of variable and I'm going to define k, no, k is already used, m equals to k minus n0. So this would be summation m equals to minus infinity to n minus n0 x of m which is equal to y of n minus n0. So this is also a causal system. I give it a shifted input, I get a shifted output. Sorry, not a, I mean, it's time invariant, not causal. So accumulator. Any question on these two examples? I'm going to make it smaller. These are all examples of um, uh, time invariant systems. Let me go over time varying system. yt txt. So if I change the input to x of t minus t naught, Let's say I change the input to x of t minus t naught, I get y tilde t, which is t x t minus t naught, which is not equal to y of t minus t naught. So therefore, it's not a it's 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 a time varying system. It's not a time invariant system. Any question on time invariance? Okay, let's get to the final topic for today's class, which is linear. System. I'm sorry, could you go back that page? I, I missed it. I, I just... Let me know when you are, when you- Yep, I'm good, thank you, that's all I need. Good, good, thank you. Linear system, okay. So the linear system, the definition is it satisfies superposition. Now, what is superposition? So let's, superposition comprises of two property. The first is additive property. So X1 gives Y1 x2 gives y2 
and x1 plus x2, it's, it is an additive system if x1 plus x2 gives y1 plus y2. So we have a system which is additive. If I input x1, I get y1. If I input x2, I get y2. And then if I input x1 plus x2, I get the sum of outputs y1 plus y2. So that's the additive property. Second property, which is part of superposition, is homogeneity property. Which is, if x1 gives y1, then uh, a x1 gives a y1 for all a in complex numbers. Multiply the input with any complex number and you get the output gets amplified or multiplied by the same complex number a. So now superposition means that the system satisfies both the additive and homogeneity property. So these are two completely separate properties and superposition means it satisfies both additive and homogeneity. So the best way to write superposition property is AX1 plus BX2 yields a y1 plus b y2 a and b are complex numbers this is the superposition property Okay, let's look at the example, our favorite example, which is accumulator. So let's say my Y1 of N is summation X1 of K. K goes from minus infinity to N. My Y2 of N is now let's multiply the input to the accumulator uh, so let's do ax1 plus bx2 that's the input i'm going to give to the accumulator so that's the output y of n is going to be summation k equals minus infinity to n. So I have a series sum of two values, two series. 
So two sequences. So I can just write it as sum of the two sequences itself. So I have summation of a x one of k. K equals minus infinity to n plus summation b x two of k. K equals minus infinity to n. So I can of course do this only when x one and x two are all finite. So if one of them is infinite, then we can't do it. But we are not considering all the edge cases that you would normally consider when you are doing math. So we are assuming all of these x one and x two are all real numbers. So I can do this uh, separation. And now I can take this a out of the summation. So I have summation of a. So this proves that accumulator is a linear system. Okay, so sum of superposition of two inputs leads to the superposition of the output. Here, a and b could be any complex number, right? I can I can do this superposition because um, all of the everything that we have done so far uh, doesn't require that a or b be real number. Any question on the linear system part? Uh, let me give you an example of a non-linear system. So, example of non-linear. It's actually very easy. Y n equal to x n square, or for that matter, any non-linear function of x n. So, this is not not a linear system. It's a non-linear system. Okay, so looks like there are no further questions. So that's all I wanted to cover today. Um, so one thing that I wanted to mention that throughout this course of 3050 and 3551 and 5551 and so on, a lot of the controls courses, you will talk about linear time invariant systems, okay? So linear, so the, the system is linear, which means that it satisfies the superposition property and the system is time invariant. And a lot of systems that you would encounter like an airplane, a vehicle, engines, chemical plants, oil and natural gas plants, those are all linear. Well, they are not linear, but they can be approximated by linear time invariant systems. Okay. so. And that's why we study linear time invariant system, because as you will see throughout this course, if you assume that your system is linear and time invariant, you can actually do a lot of uh, uh, beautiful stuff with that system. But in reality, many systems are nonlinear, but you kind of linearize it, something that you will talk about in 3551. And then you uh, try to deal with the system like designing control schemes or designing signal processing schemes. You do that under the assumption that it's a linear system. It just makes your life easier. Okay, so in the next class, what we are going to talk about is linear time invariant systems and the impulse response and convolution, which leads to 
uh, understanding of the behavior of LTI system, linear time invariant system. So that's what we will be talking about in the next class. Uh, thank you for your attention and have a great weekend. I'll stick around if you have any questions.